This week, Anthony Iani, author of Centered, Autism Basketball and One Athlete's Dreams, talks about being proud of his autism. Number one, it made me the person I am today. Number two, it helped me make history, not just in my life, but in Michigan State. But three, it's because I want to show others that autism doesn't define who I am. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my co-host and mother, Caroline Kilborn. Hi, Mom. Hi. Beautiful day again. <laughs> Every time someone says that, I want to start singing that um, Mr. Rogers song, you know, beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day. Yeah, right. <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> I love that song. So... <laughs> So, Mom, would you like to introduce our guest today? I would. It, this this is an amazing, amazing story, amazing book, and I I highly recommend it to uh, people who, well, you'll, you'll see what, who would want to read this when we get started talking about it. But our author, or the person whose book it is, it's about is Anthony Iani, and uh, he played basketball at Michigan State University from 2009 to 2012 and was the first Division I college basketball player known to be on the autism spectrum. He now tours the country as a motivational speaker and lives with his wife and two sons in Livonia, Michigan. And, uh, and uh, the other person involved in this is Rob Keast. He grew up in Lapeer, Michigan, and studied journalism in, at Michigan State University. He has written for newspapers in Michigan and Illinois and has taught English in Tokyo, Japan, and since 2004, he taught high school English in one, one donut, Michigan. He's a teenage daughter, so I think Anthony can tell us how their how their, this works. How their partnership the worked in writing yeah, right. in writing the huh? book, and yeah. the book is called "Centered: Autism, Basketball, and One Athlete's Dreams." Welcome to Writers' Voices, Anthony. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's a privilege <laughs> to be here. Now I need to ask: Do you always go by Anthony, or do you ever go by Tony? So, so I actually be honest with you, like nobody's ever. The last person that ever called me Tony was my, uh, was my, uh, fr- was my freshman year with my U.S. history teacher. She was the <laughs> only one that ever called me Tony, just out of the blue. And so, so I, I kind of rolled with it my entire freshman year. So I was like, all right, you know, you can call me Tony, that's fine. But that, that was the last person that ever called me Tony. <laughs> well, the reason I ask is because my son is Anthony. And I always called mm-hmm. him Anthony. I never called him Tony. No one called him Tony until he grew up and left home. And he's been Tony ever since. And it took me a long I time <laughs> to adjust from Anthony to Tony. <laughs> and for a while, it's was like, huh? Who are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, welcome to Writer's Voices, Anthony. Tell us a little bit about how this book came to be. So basically how it came to be was about seven years ago, um, I was speaking at a middle school in um, Macomb County, Michigan. So it was uh, Shelby Junior High. And, uh, you know, after I got done, so I do a lot of, I do a lot of pre- uh, different presentations all over the state of Michigan, all over the country. Um, I do transitioning in life with autism presentations. I do talks on leadership. I do anti-bullying presentations. So I was giving an anti-bullying talk at Shelby Junior High. And after I got done, uh, the principal and I were just talking and the principal says to me, Hey, have you ever thought about, you know, putting your entire life story in a book? I was like, well, so I really haven't thought about it. And, you know, I'm just so busy with, you know, being on the road so much, you know, I'm in a different town and a different state, you know, from every, every day from week to week. So I don't even know if I would have time to even consider doing something like that. And she said to me, well, you, you really should, because, you know, I, I really feel like that our kids would benefit more, you know, from your story than just the 40, 45 minutes of what they heard from you today. And so, and she said, and you never know, it could really take your career to another level. You never thought it could. So, so about four years after all that went down, I finally said to myself, you know what, it's time. Like it's time for me to, you know, really put my entire life story in in the book form. And, and um, that's what I did. And so, um, so I talked to a couple of people about how I should go about the process and, and obviously, I wanted to work with somebody on it. And um, my my resource room middle school, um, my middle school resource room teacher, uh, Susie Hall, um, she introduced me to her husband's cousin, uh, Rob Keys, who ended up being my co-author for the book. And 
And uh, Rob and I, you know, we immediately hit it off right away. And it wasn't just a, a, a partnership. You guys it ended up becoming a, an incredible friendship that has developed so much over the last three years. And so Rob and I did like five, six interviews in a month, um, you know, that were about uh, five, anywhere from two to three hours long. Uh, we got the book written by the end of, uh, by the beginning of fall 2018. And then we went um, eight months looking for an agent. So we ended up signing with uh, Joe Perry of Perry Literary Incorporated in New York. And in, uh, I believe it was June 2019. And then a year after that, we signed with IU Press to be our publisher. And so um, that's kind of how it all came about. Just, you know, people getting in my ear and telling me, hey, you need to do this. You should really look into it. And, you know, after finally convincing myself and having multiple conversations with different people about how I should go about the process, um, you know, that's when it all started for me. And it's definitely, it was definitely a process that it was definitely an interesting one because it taught me a lot of different things, like being a little bit more patient with things in life. Um, but it also yeah. taught me to, you know, just really enjoy, you know, what, what you have going on in front of you. And, and, and now that the book is finally out and released, you know, I'm very, very excited to see what the future holds for not, not just the book itself, but for uh, my career as well. I think probably for the careers of a lot of a lot of young people who are going to be inspired by this, that's my feeling about it. So yeah, that. definitely, and that and that's part of the other reason why you know I may I like we we did center was because we wanted to give a lot of people hope and inspiration who really need it, and so um, and obviously for parents and kids and educators in the autism community who can really use his book as a resource as well for their students and kids was definitely another big reason why we also wanted to get this going. Well, I think it's also important to not just for people in the autistic community, but for others who maybe don't have a lot of familiarity with autism and to, mm -hmm. to oh, yeah. see kind of how broad the spectrum really is. And right. yeah, that, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, 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 and I think, the number one reason why, you know, I wanted to do this book too was because, you know, like you mentioned, I wanted to educate people about what autism is because, you know, there were some things that Rob and I talked about adding into the book, which we ended up adding in there. For example, my, my IEP evaluations, my individualized education plan evaluations from anywhere from when I was in kindergarten all the way till like sixth grade. And, um, and these were evaluations, you guys, I had never read before in my life. Oh, wow. And so my, so my mom, you know, God bless my mom, like she keep, she still has like folders and stack piles like of, of paperwork from all my IEP meetings. And, you know, when Rob approached me about, you know, how I would feel about putting these evaluations in the book, at first I wasn't too keen, keen in on it because um, – I told Rob, I said, you know, there were some, there are some things that are probably in those evaluations that I'm not too proud of and things that I did as a four or five year old, six year old kid, I wasn't too proud of. Um, but again, I, you know, that was when I was five and six. Um, you, you, you look at things differently when you're an adult um, because, it's the, because like, for example, there were some certain things in the evaluations that I talked about how I had a certain um, obsession for certain fabrics and feels, uh, for example. And I told Rob, you know, I wasn't too proud of that. Um, and he said to me, he said, well, think of it this way. Don't think of what's best for you, the author. Think of what's best for your readers because your readers who want to learn more about what autism is, what kind of an impact it can have on others, and more importantly, like the educators and the parents of kids who have autism, like this is going to impact them the most. So don't think about what's best for you, the author. Think about what's best for your reader. And once he told me that, I was like, okay, well, Give me a, give me a night to sleep on it, and I'll let you know. I didn't even sleep on it, you guys. Like I, I, I called him. I called him back an hour later. I said, "All right, let's do this." And so, <laughs> and so, I, I definitely am very happy that you know Rob and I were able to put specific things and details like that in the book because you know I, I told Rob when we first connected, I said, you know, I really want to get as much detail in there as possible about what autism is, get in there as much detail as I can about what I went through growing up on the spectrum as a young kid because. You know, there, there are a lot of, you know, basketball fans, especially Michigan State fans who who know my story, but they don't know the entire gist of my story, which is, you know, it's all in it's all in centered. And so, you know, I really wanted to show people, you know, yeah, I had to I had to scratch and claw my way to get to Michigan State. But at the same time, I had to do even more scratching and clawing as a young kid just to get to where I'm at today. Mm -hmm. 
know, well, that, that's why I think I think this should be <laughs> required reading for <laughs> for a lot of people because it's just uh, you know, well, I I had no idea about that there are all these different uh, uh, things about autism. I I really didn't, and I'm sure I'm sure a lot of parents don't because you know people. Well, we have a tendency, I think, to think autism is, it's not a, you know, it's its, it's a life sentence, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and that it's a, it's a terrible thing. But your story does, makes it sound like, or your story is very inspiring because, yes, you're autistic, and yes, that has caused some issues in your life, but it's not the whole story by a, by a long shot. No, I mean, not even close. And, like, you know, because, like, it's like um, when I had the conversation with the Shelby Junior High principal seven years ago, you know, when she brought up the point of, you know, our students only get to hear, like, maybe one-fourth of your life story in a 40, 45-minute time span. And and she was right, you know, because, you know, I, I whenever I go out and do my inside bowling presentations to kids, like, I talk about a couple – like, I talk about my life being diagnosed with autism and how – you know, I end up playing for Michigan State, doing all this other stuff, but they don't really hear the full details of, okay, how, like, what was the reason for leading up to his diagnosis? You know, what were some of the signs that his parents saw? And, and you know, especially from an educator standpoint, like, you know, teachers would like to know too, because, you know, what were some of the things that, you know, Anthony Ianni's teachers did for him to help him get to where he's at today? Um, and so, and I really wanted, you know, students, especially older students to kind of, you know, get a better idea of what autism is and what I went through as a kid. And so for them to not only hear the anti-bullying presentations I do, but then to go right into, hey, you know, here's an entire book about my life story. So you're going to hear more, like not only will you hear and read more about bullying that I dealt with as a kid, but you're also going to read about some of the things that I had overcome in my life, you know, to get to where I'm at today. Right. You know, one thing it makes me wonder about is, um, you know, some of the behaviors that you exhibited as a child that, as you say, you're not proud of. But, I mean, face it, all of us at four, five, six years old have done things that we're not proud of as an adult. But, right. you know, it's like <laughs> picking your nose, but <laughs> all kinds of things. <laughs> but, um, but I wonder sometimes if... If you're, if you had not been diagnosed, if your parents had not taken, made that effort to find this out and communicated it to the schools, whether you would have ended up being punished for behaviors that you really had no control over, and whether that happens to a lot of other kids, do you have any thoughts on that? You know, there there are times I do look back and go. You know, what if my mom and dad did not take me to Children's Hospital in Columbus to get diagnosed? You know, what if they just were like, oh, well, you know, he just, you know, our son just doesn't listen to directions very well. Um, You know, I've always thought about that. But at the same time, I've also looked back and go, you know what, like, even if it was like, uh, because initially, so my parents took me um, and my first initial diagnosis was ADD. But my mom, you know, she coached uh, college volleyball at, at Ohio University at the time. And my mom said to the doctor, like, no, like, I know what ADD is. Like, I coach volleyball players who have ADD, and this is not it. So for my mom to kind of be able to spot the difference between what autism and ADD is, you know, it was definitely, you know, kind of big on her part. And But there are times where I look back and go, all right, what if I didn't get diagnosed? Like, where would I end up today? Like, would I have gotten punished, you know, more and more in school because of my outbursts, because of my behaviors. And so, and, and there are parents that I've talked to who, who deal with that on a daily basis. Like sometimes like, you know, if their child, if their son or daughter is not diagnosed and they have, and, and they get phone calls from, you know, their principal or their teacher saying, Hey, you know, your son or daughter's in detention today because this happened today. Um, because again, like, you know, it's all about, it's all about educating yourself. It's all about, making sure you're aware of what autism is and what a certain diagnosis is. And, you know, that was during a time period when I was diagnosed where nobody knew what autism really was during that time period. No, there was no awareness for it. There was no, there was no resources, no paths or guidance for individuals and families who were affected by autism at that time. So, you know, for my parents to not only get the diagnosis for me, but for them to, 
be able to find ways working with the sc school administrators and the um, the special education assistant director of Okemos Public Schools at the time, Sandy McDonald, for them to work together and to find different ways and find different resources for me to help me be successful. You know, I'm super, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed that they were all able to come together and find ways to, you know, make sure that I had the accommodations to get um, by to be successful in school. Well, also, didn't your grandfather do some groundbreaking work in that in education even before you were born? He he did. So my, my late grandfather, um, Nicholas Anthony Ianni Sr., he did some work with some legislators to help individuals who were special uh, needs or special ed to help them get the accommodations and services they needed to be successful in schools. And I did not know about, um, I didn't, I didn't know about that. I didn't know my grandfather did all that. And so when I uh, first started um, uh, being a self-advocate and an anti-bullying advocate, you know, nine years ago, I always asked myself the question, like, I'm like, okay, like there's gotta be a reason why I got into the field of being a, an advocate. And then as Rob and I were working on the book together and we were talking to my grandmother and my dad about my grandfather, you know, we, I found out right then and there, he was a big advocate for students with special needs and he worked with state legislators to get the accommodations and resources for those kids to be successful. And I was like, I was like, okay, well that explains why I'm a big advocate in certain fields because my grandfather was. So a lot of the work he did with legislators was a big reason why I was able to get those same accommodations and resources that others before me have gotten was because of his advocacy work in that field. That's wonderful. Now, was this the same grandfather who didn't want to accept your diagnosis and said you just needed to be spanked more, or was that a different grandfather? No, so that so that that was my that was my mom's dad. Okay. That was my mom's dad. So my, my, my so Nick, Nick Iani was uh, was my dad's dad. Okay, okay, because that is some like a you know. You you write about how when you were acting out as a child, your mother was getting you know was being looked you know getting this getting dirty looks like why don't you control your child and right that's boy it just makes us makes you feel a lot more makes me feel a lot more sympathetic um, towards families in that situation. It isn't that they aren't doing a good job it's it's a, this condition mm -hmm. it's um, right exactly and, and again like you know like I like anytime I read that story about um, my mom's dad you know saying hey you know he needs to be disciplined more but again like again that was also during a time period where nobody really knew what autism was but at the same time you know my grandfather would still be the one to say hey let's go for a ride on my tractor around the yard or let's go for a ride on the on the on the on the on the riding lawnmower and you can sit on my lap and so so my grandfather you know did my mom's dad my grandfather um james van arsdale and you know my grandpa jim you know he found different ways for me to you know kind of like um trying to think of the best way to say it like kind of like to keep me occupied and to keep me calm on the farm whenever I go and visit him and my grandmother. Um, so he found different ways to keep me calm. And that was either riding on the tractor or just, you and know, going of, on. Um, yeah. To diffuse the situation. And yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So he was very understanding in that way. Yes, he was definitely. Yeah. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Anthony Iani, author of Centered, Autism, Basketball, and One Athlete's Dreams. So, Anthony, in our kind of stereotype of an, someone with autism, becoming a public speaker would seem to be the last career choice you would expect, that I would expect. <laughs> No, definitely. definitely. <laughs> and yet, here we, here you are. So, what? How? Why? And and is it hard so, for you? So, long, so long story short, um, so it was going in. So it was just toward the end of my senior year, um, senior year of college at Michigan State, and. Uh, so like every other senior in college, I had no idea what I was going to do or where I was going to go in my life. And um, so it wasn't until uh, the lieutenant governor at the time, Brian Kelly, 
um, who at the time was trying to get legislation to pass um, to pass a bill or pass a legislature to for insurance companies to help families with autism, you know, get coverages provided. Um, whether it was for treatments or ABA therapies and classes. So he was trying to get that pushed at the time to get done. And so he actually was a keynote speaker at our basketball banquet my senior year. And I had no idea who Brian was. I had no idea what his job title was. All I heard was Lieutenant Governor. And in my mind, you know, my autistic brain, I was thinking, okay, well, Lieutenant, you know, he, he's got to be with the Army or something like that. I had no idea at the time that Lieutenant Governor was like the – the quote unquote vice president to the governor of the state of Michigan, if you will. Um, so at that time, Brian had heard about my story and he, his office had called my parents' house and said, Hey, you know, would Anthony be willing to do a keynote uh, speech at this autism gala in Detroit at the end of April? And I told them, I said, well, let me finish the basketball season and then I'll go ahead and let you guys know as soon as we're done. So after the season, like I didn't even hesitate. Like I, you know, I, we called his office back and I said, yes, absolutely. I would love to do it. And so I went to the autism gala in downtown Detroit. It was a great setup. I met a lot of great people. I did like a nine, 10 minute speech that got a great ovation and a great reaction to it. And I was driving my wife, um, my girlfriend at the time, I was driving her home. And I said to her, I said, you know, I said, babe, I said, I think I know what I'm supposed to do in my life. She said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, other than, other than Dr. Temple Grandin, who's one of the biggest, you know, one of the most famous individuals in the world with autism, who's one of my biggest mentors to this day. I said, other than her, can you name me somebody who's a big hero, idol, role model, and leader in the autism community that people look up to? And my, you know, my, my wife sat, sat in her seat in silence. She couldn't think of anybody. And that's when I looked at her and I said, you know what? I'm going to go be that guy. I'm going to go be that hero, that role model, icon, and inspiration that people in the autism community can look up to. I said, I'm going to go be that guy. And that's what really kind of kickstarted my career for me after that. And then like two months later, I was hired by the nonprofit organization that hosted the Autism Gala to um, do uh, not just autism advocacy work, but do a lot of uh, anti-bullying presentations. And then uh, three years later, in March 2015, I was hired by the Michigan Department of Civil Rights and um, in our in our government, one of our government departments, to continue to do that work. And so, um, so that's how it all started, you know. So our former lieutenant governor really kind of kickstarted my career and and just asking the question of my wife at the time, hey, other than Dr. Temple Grandin, who else do you know is in the same position that she is to be that big inspiration for the autism community? And when she couldn't think of anybody, that's immediately when I stepped up and said, all right, I'm going to go be that person. So and that's how it all started. And, wow. and I love, I love, and I'll, and I'll repeat it a thousand times more. I love interacting with, with people. And one of the biggest, one of the toughest things about the pandemic was not traveling and not being able to have that same interaction that I would have with a live crowd through a computer. Um, so I started traveling for speaking last week and for me to, be back in front of live audiences again was, was, was a joy and a blast because, you know, I love inspiring as many people as I can, but I got one goal and that's if, if I inspire one person everywhere I go, then my job is done because that's all it takes in life is just to inspire one person. And so if somebody can get something inspiring out of my story, if somebody can go out there and be the change in life they wish to see from my story, then my job is done. And anytime I get to interact with students and teachers and hear about their stories and their feedback on my presentations, it, it's what really makes my job so special. Oh, that, yeah. I know I, I, really, I taught uh, junior high and high school, and, and uh, there are a couple of students that went on to do things with their life that I was really proud of them for, and so that, that meant a lot to me. And, uh, you know, because I know that um, in one case, there was this boy who was very, uh, uh, he was a problem. <laughs> but uh, I, in one of my classes, I said, if you want to, if you students want to make some uh, extra credit, um, you can go into the special ed classes, as that teacher. I've checked with her already. And, you know, you can shoot hoops or something with, with somebody. So that's what he did. And he turned out to mm -hmm. be a special ed teacher. Wow. So that was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was, you know, to me, that was really something. Yeah, I know it can happen. You know, uh, I, got, I noticed here that sometimes autism uh, prevents 
uh, prevented you from recognizing cruelty. And mm-hmm. is, that a, is that a disability or a gift, do you think? <laughs> you know, it, it's funny because no, I was gonna say, you know, I actually had um I actually had somebody ask me that question the other day, you know, when it came to my diagnosis because you know, as a kid, you know, being bullied a lot, you know, there were times where I couldn't tell that that person was actually being the bully because, you know, the language aspect of being on the autism spectrum was I didn't understand a lot of nouns, verbs, idioms, and jokes and sarcasm at the time. And so for me, it was a, it was a blessing because I just thought the person was just talking to me and, and being my friend. But whereas, you know, 20 some years later, I look back on that and go, yeah, like it was a, it's a blessing because, you know, I didn't understand what the person was saying. But at the same time, you know, I guess you could say it was somewhat of a curse because, you know, I was picked on because of my autism, but I just didn't pick it up during that time. Right. right. Well, and, and I think it was a blessing because you, uh, you know, I'm sure that some, some people who have autism are just, they're just um, pushed down and pushed down until they, they don't know where to go, you know. And right. So, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, reading some of the stories of the ways that you were bullied was really heart wrenching. And um, do you? And there were some times where people, like when you were older, now maybe not when you were younger, but when you were older, where where once you told people about your autism, they were a little, they were maybe were kinder to you. Do you? Did you find that to be true? Yes and no. Um, I say yes because, um, you know, once people actually understood, you know, oh, well, th- this is why Anthony says this. This is why he may do that. This is why he's a little shy. Like, you know, there there were some people who really did take it to heart and understood it and wanted to understand more, whether it was, you know, my coaches, my teammates, or some of my closest friends, my teachers and classmates. Like, But then there were also some who, you know, I told, and then immediately they treated me differently and didn't you know, talk to me hardly ever after that. Oh. And I think that was either because that they didn't either understand what autism really was or um, they just didn't see it as something that, you know, that they wanted to be bothered with. And so, because again, like I'm one of those really, I'm one of those outgoing individuals who, you know, if you tell like, if, if, if I want to just chat with you and get to know you, then yeah, I'm going to be straight up with you. But if I tell you something about personal about me and you don't and you take it the wrong way or, you know, you don't want to learn more about it, then there's nothing I can do about that. So that but at the same time, that's when I really knew who my true friends were and who the people were who just wanted to either just hang on or just latch on to me because of the basketball piece that was in my life. Mm. Mm You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Anthony Ianni, author of Centered Autism, Basketball, and One Athlete's Dreams. And the dream really was for a long time to play basketball at Michigan State. How did you make that dream come true? Uh, it was not easy. Um, you know, I remember when I was eight years old, um, that was kind of like around the first time I ever met coach Izzo when I was eight years old. And I told coach Izzo when I was eight years old, I was going to play for him, like straight up, didn't hesitate. I was going to play for him. And, you know, I think at that time, coach Izzo probably thought it was like, Oh, you know, you know, that's cute. You know, an eight, an eight year old kid, fourth grader, fifth grader, or whatever at the time is telling me he's going to play basketball for me one day. Um, but, you know, for it to become a reality, it was not easy. Um, I had to put a, I had to put in a lot of hard work when it came to my basketball game. Um, you know, playing on, on the right AAU travel ball teams for a couple of years had to really put me in a good position. And, you know, I was recruited by a lot of schools when I was in high school. You know, Michigan State recruited me, uh, Michigan, Notre Dame, uh, Purdue, Wisconsin, um, a lot of the MAC teams. I know uh, Drake, Drake University in Iowa looked at me, Valpo University, um, Eastern, Western, Central Michigan. So a lot of schools like that. Um, but I was down to three schools uh, to choose from. And it was either Oakland University in Rochester Hills, Michigan, who gave me my very first full ride offer um, scholarship. 
Uh, Grand Valley State University, who uh, one of the top Division II athletic programs in the country, offered me. And then you know, Coach Izzo and his staff in Michigan State offered me to be a preferred walk-on. Um, so, you know, but I wanted to be on scholarship, you know, at Michigan State. That was always the goal, always the dream. And, you know, when Oakland University pulled back their scholarship, it was either between Michigan, it was between Michigan State and Grand Valley State. And I was torn because Michigan State was always my dream school. It was the place I always wanted to be at from day one. And, but there was also a full ride scholarship offer on the table that I couldn't, that you can't refuse because it's free school, free tuition, like free everything. And so I had a meeting with Coach Zizzo about it. And he was straight up honest with me and said, look, I'll be honest with you. Like you could come to Michigan State and be a walk on right off the gate or right off the bat. But I can't promise you that you're going to get a scholarship down the road. Like, I can't promise you that. Um, he said, so I'll be honest with you. Like you have a full ride offer on the table that a full ride that'll take care of your family, take care of school. Like you don't have to worry about a thing and you will get a great education from one of the top universities in our state. And you will get to play for a coach who's one of the best division two coaches in the country. And so he encouraged me um, to go play for Grand Valley state. Cause you know, it's a full ride offer compared to a walk-on spot. But the last thing he said to me was, but Hey, just know that if things don't work out at Grand Valley state, just know you have a locker and a Jersey here waiting for you if you ever want it. And that offer always stood. And so after things didn't work out for me at Grand Valley state, um, you know, I think everybody, I think everybody had a pretty good idea of where I was going to go. Um, and that was Michigan state. And so coaches and I had a meeting and, one of the many things he said to me was, look, here's the deal. Like, just because you have autism does not mean I'm going to treat you any differently. I'm going to treat you and coach you like every other player that's come here before and every player that's come that will come after you. So I'm going to treat you how I'll treat every other player here. And, you know, I looked at him and said, coach, that's all I want. I don't want to be, I don't want any special treatment for having autism. Like I want to be coached and treated like every other player that's come before me. And so, and that that's how it all that's how it all began and so i was a walk-on for two years in michigan state and going into my uh senior year michigan state i was you know the the ultimate dream came true for me and that was to be on scholarship for michigan state which is what i which is what coaches awarded me going into my senior year so um got to be a part of a couple of big 10 championship teams there and a team that went to a final four and you know just an incredible experience i had at michigan state so it was definitely a lot of hard work but you know, the support system I had in my corner was one of the biggest reasons why I was able to achieve and accomplish my dream. Now, Anthony, other than the money aspect, what is the difference between being a walk-on and being a scholarship athlete? So obviously, you know, walk-ons, they have to do a lot of the extra dirty work in practice. Um, they have to be on the scout team, which is what I was on a lot. Uh, my senior year, I was captain of the scout team. Um, so what the scout team does is that they have to run like anywhere from 20 to 30 different plays that our opponents run. And so we play our first and second team uh, starters in practice and they have to go up against the scout team and try to guard and defend um, the plays that will run that our opponents will run. So that way our, that our, so that way our starters are ready to go for what could happen um, when we play our opponent, whether it's Duke, Iowa, Michigan, Ohio state, whoever. So, but what, but what's insane is is that, you know, you go from learning one opponent's plays to another opponent's plays, you know, like two, three days later. And so um, so doing doing all the little things, doing all the dirty work that nobody gets to see behind the scenes. Um, and obviously you may not get to play a whole lot as a walk-on, which, you know, that's one of the biggest differences between a scholarship and a walk-on player is that you may not get a whole lot of playing time, which is one of the sacrifices that some walk-ons make. But at the end of the day, you know, I think you know, there are a lot of walk-ons who walk on the team, but they're also there to get just get their degree. And mm. having Michigan State basketball on a resume doesn't hurt either. Um, but there are guys who go to Michigan State as walk-ons and work their tail off, and they get a full-ride scholarship like myself. And uh, so just doing a lot of, you know, a lot of little things behind, the, you know, behind the scenes that nobody else will see. And, um, and that's the one thing I've always I've always told our fans is like, hey. If you were to, if you saw me in practice, if you saw me, you know, behind the scenes, you know, going up against our main starters every day, you would understand why I earn so much respect, not just from Coach Izzo, but from everybody else in the basketball program as well. Yeah, I had no idea before reading your book 
about a scout team and and it does seem like in mm-hmm. some ways having a really good scout team can be the difference between a national champion and an also ran team no absolutely and even when i was in high school like you know we had like we knew who our starters were we knew who our second team guys were but like even guys who didn't play a whole lot like they really had to like come to practice every day and you know, I, I would play I would play a guy on my high school team named Tom Stout and Tom wasn't the biggest guy on the team, but like he did everything and more to kick my butt in practice every day, which is what <laughs> I loved about him. And, and and that's kind of like the mentality I brought when it came to, you know, practices at Grand Valley State or even Michigan State was I wanted to make my teammates better and I was gonna do the little things and everything and more to do that. And so and I think like I said, that was the one thing that, you know, Coach Izzo, you know, always told our scout team was if you don't get our starters ready, we're not going to be successful. And so I really took that to heart. And so I made sure like all my, all the other guys on the scout team that were with me, you know, I had to make sure and remind them that, Hey, if we're going to beat Michigan on uh, this weekend, if we're going to beat Ohio state, like we got to be the reason why our guys are going to get ready. Like we got to make sure that we're going to be the toughest group of guys that they're going to face all week. Now, how tall are you, Anthony? Um, six foot nine. So that was definitely an advantage for basketball, but yeah, it also, <laughs> but it also made you a target when you were younger, didn't it? It did. It did. And autism was not the only reason why I was bullied as a kid. It was also because of my height. Um, when I was 11 years old, I was six feet tall with a size 13 shoe. And I was a really literally, literally and figuratively speaking, I was a big target when it came to, uh, bullying because of my height. Um, and so, you know, it was tough for me to deal with. Um, and, and, and every day I would ask myself the question, you know, why would, why would anybody want to bully me and tease me because of my height? And, you know, I still never got those answers, but, you know, I was able to find ways to overcome the bullying, not through words, not through, you know, using my feet or my, um, or my hands, but just by, by letting my actions do all the talking for me. Why don't you read a little bit from Centered for us? Absolutely. Any uh, any specific place that you want me to read read from, or you just want me to pick? Mom, you have any anything you'd like to hear? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> there's so much good stuff in here. But um, read about how the uh, the um, teacher, Mrs. Hall, in that room, how that helped you. Oh, okay. I was really impressed with with her, and it's, it's interesting that you connected with her later, and then and and then got ended up with uh, with Rob. So it just shows it's not it, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know that was that was definitely just a really instant connection right away, and for me to uh, for me to be able to have somebody like um, Susie Hall in my life, it's just been it's just awesome, and and not just her, but like you know, every other person who I've had in my life too, which is where, whether it's, you know, my teachers and my parents or my friends, like it's just been awesome. So, um, I got it. I okay. Got it. Awesome. I, I, page 94, maybe. Uh, page 93. I got it right here. Okay. So I'll definitely, I'll definitely go ahead and read about my favorite, my favorite teacher. Well, I should say one of my favorite teachers, because if I say my favorite all-time teacher, I may be getting phone calls from other teachers saying, hey, I thought I, I, thought I was there. So, um, but, yeah, I'll, uh, but yeah, I'm definitely honored to read about, you know, one of my favorite uh, classes I had. Um, so this is in Chapter 10 uh, called Do Those Impressions on page 93. One place where nobody picked on me was in Mrs. Hall's classroom. Nobody took advantage of my nevity and demanded curly impressions or called me freak or green giant because of my height. It was the safest, most calming room at Chippewa Middle School. Mrs. Hall was a special education teacher. In all three years, I had had her one period a day for resource room. Resource room was like a study period, except that every kid in there was part of the special education program. I still didn't know I was autistic, but I knew that I needed extra help in school. I kept up with my homework just fine but tests were another story. Frequently, the questions didn't make sense to me. Let's say my language arts teacher had the class read an article about Jane Goodall, and we had to answer multiple choice questions at the end of the passage. One of the questions might look like this. Question one, what is the author's purpose in writing this article? A, to entertain the reader with stories about chimpanzees. 
B, to inform the reader of the important of wildlife conversation. C, to encourage travelers to visit Africa's natural wonders. D, to describe the work and life of Jane Goodall. I can make a case for every answer. The article mentioned chimpanzees in protecting wildlife in Africa and Jane Goodall. They were all right. How was I supposed to pick one? And then, what about, what about that word purpose? Purpose means a lot of things. You could do something on purpose. You can go somewhere with a specific purpose. It was like the ducks on the pond all over again. Trying to answer a question like that made me want to punch my own head. But Mrs. Hall could always calm me down. This, your, this room is your safe place, she, assured, she reassured me. I started taking my quizzes and tests in Mrs. Hall's resource room. She crossed out one or two answers that I didn't have to deal with, so many options swirling around in my brain. Mrs. Hall often read the questions aloud, pausing to explain words like purpose. In middle school, I often felt completely alone, academically, socially, physically, you name it, except in Mrs. Hall's classroom. Every kid in the class was in the same boat. We all needed extra help and extra time. Not everyone was autistic. Students with a variety of disabilities were in there. Most of the kids, I never found out what their learning disability was. Really, it didn't matter. Maybe in other classrooms, your peers can make you feel uncool for asking questions or requesting help but not in Mrs. Hall's room. We all had each other's backs. Resource room felt like a family. It was a safe place to struggle and be vulnerable. Mrs. Hall must have sensed that school was a source of anxiety for most of us. Everything about her room put us at ease. She had couches where we could stretch out and read, and there were computer stations where we could work on assignments from other classes so that we didn't feel so, um, so we didn't feel so behind all the time. Mrs. Hall put out snacks for us, always a great way to put students in a good mood. She hung a Michigan State flag in her room, and when March Madness came around, we used her whiteboard to follow the brackets. Mrs. Hall turned on the radio sometimes, and you could feel the, and you could feel the stress leave the room. So that was, uh, that was mm. Mrs. Hall's classroom. <laughs> the, those resource rooms were really important for you, weren't they? They and, were, because... Yeah. Because without, without, and it wasn't just Mrs. Hall, you know, uh, Liz Schaefer, Mrs. Schaefer, who was my resource room teacher from my freshman year to my senior year in high school. I mean, just, just having those two being able to not only reassure me that their rooms were, their classrooms were safe places for me, but for them to, you know, say to me, hey, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask me. Like, no question is too stupid in my classroom. And you know, any anything, anytime you need help with something, like just let me know. And without their support, without their help, you know, when it came to, you know, tests or um, writing assignments or classroom assignments, like I really don't know how I would have made it out of middle school or high school. Um, so I, I'm super grateful for Mrs. Hall and Mrs. Schaefer. What were some of the kind of workarounds that you learned to use in school? Um, I think for me, it was making sure that, um, that I used every single resource that was offered to me or given to me in in school. Um, I didn't, I didn't learn that until I was a freshman in high school. My, my academic coordinator at Grand Valley State University, um, Dr. Damon Arnold, who's one of my biggest mentors to this day. Um, the first time he and I had ever had a conversation, um, you know, we had a meeting, my first day of freshman classes at Grand Valley State. And the first thing he says to me is, you know, you know, utilize your resources because you utilize every single resource that's offered you or given to you. I guarantee you will graduate from this fine university of ours in four to five years. So any resource that was offered to me or given to me in college, and even today, you know, in the, in the world that I'm in, in professional speaking, like any, any resource that's offered me, given to me, like I try to use it to the fullest of its ability because I wanted to be successful in the classroom. And so, so if my teacher had study hall hour, I'm in the, I'm using that study hall hour to ask questions. And so, um, so I really didn't learn about using my resources until I got to college. But when I got to high school, you know, it was always, it was always my resource room where I can go and take all my tests and use those accommodations to my fullest ability. And in just having my teachers reassure me, Hey, if you have any questions, like, just let me know. Or if you don't, you want to talk to me privately after class, like just know that my desk is, you know, my door is always open anytime you want to talk. 
it's from reading your book it seemed like one of the one of the ways that autism affected you was um and kind of a difficulty understanding um turn you know phrases or words that didn't mean exactly what they sound you know like yeah yeah so is that still an issue for you and how do you oh, yeah. deal with it oh yeah it still is and one of the main struggles i have i have to this day are jokes and sarcasm and i'm better now than what i was 10 years ago but i've also learned to cope with the fact that i'm going to continue to have these struggles for the rest of my life but i'm okay with that because that's what makes me me that's what makes me unique if you will um but you know are there times where I still have some of my friends, I still have colleagues or even my wife who are they, do they still joke and with me and are they still sarcastic with me at times? And I still can't catch whether they're sarcastic or not. Absolutely. Because, you know, that's just who I am, but how I'm able to deal with it is I'm not afraid to lean on to a colleague at work and say, Hey, was so-and-so being serious or was he just kidding? And they would just be like, Oh no, he was just kidding. Like, don't worry about it. Or, you know, my wife, for example, like if I can't tell that my wife is being sarcastic, you know, I would have a blank, just a blank stare, or blank look <laughs> on my face. And she would just say to me, you know, babe, hey, I'm just kidding. Sarcasm, you know, it, it's OK. And so um, and, and that's the one of the one of the biggest blessings about being married to my wife is that, you know, she's able she understands me. And if there are times where, you know, I say something out of the blue and I just say something I don't mean to say and. You know, my wife gets upset about it or something. She still is able to walk away from that situation and go, you know what? That's my husband. You know, that's just who he is. And that's why I love him. And so, mm. um, but again, like, you know, whenever my teammates were sarcastic, you know, at Michigan State, I wasn't afraid to lean on to somebody and go, hey, was so-and-so being, you know, was he serious or was he just joking? And so and my teammates would just be like, oh, no, he was joking. Like, don't worry about it. So me, me being able to lean on to others and just straight up ask them the question, hey, was this person being serious or was he joking? And so um, for me to be able to just ask somebody that question and not be af being afraid to ask it, you know, it's definitely been one of the reasons why I've been able to kind of, kind of tell the difference between joking and sarcasm. I still struggle with it, but again, it's a struggle I'm probably going to have for the rest of my life. Now you um, wrote in your book about an episode during your maybe it was your, before your, at the end of your junior year at Michigan State mm -hmm. um, with Coach Izzo that was a, an outburst. Is that, you want to tell us a little bit about that? And is that something you still have to watch out for, that type of incident? Yeah, so what happened was, um, it was March, it was not March, it was May 1st, 2011. And <laughs> I'm always going to remember this day very well because um, this was the same day that um, President Obama at the time had announced we had – that our troops had killed Osama bin Laden. But before all that went down, um, you know, we had a team meeting, and Coach Izzo walks in, and this is the day before finals. And Coach Izzo walks in, and, you know, he's firing everybody. He's firing us up about finals, you know, telling us to finish strong. And he called some guys out about their grades. Now, he wasn't doing it to be mean or anything like that. He was just doing it to fire guys, to fire people up because, you know, he wants everybody to finish strong and, you know, have a great couple weeks off and then come back for spring and summer workouts and classes and just be ready. Uh, when he got to me, though, I didn't take it that way. So, you know, he was saying, you know, I don't know why you – I don't know why your grades have slipped a lot. I don't know what the deal is. You know, maybe you're hanging out with your girlfriend too much or maybe you're just, you know – maybe you're being around your family too much or blah, blah, blah. And I got up out of my chair and I started cussing out our hall of fame coach in front of the whole team. <laughs> and so, so I remember Draymond green, who was my teammate at the time, who now split, who plays for the golden state warriors in the NBA. He looked at me and whispered to me and said, Hey man, like, do you want to be on this team? I mean, heck, do you, do you even want to walk out of here alive tonight? Like, what are you doing? And so um, so afterwards, you know, Coach Izzo gave me the evilest stare that a person's ever given me to this day. And he told me to go to his office right after the meeting, and that's what I did. And so um, so I went to his office, and I immediately broke down crying. First time I've ever done this in front of a coach that involved my personal life. 
And it was because, you know, my uncle was murdered uh, before that season had even started. And um, so I kind of told Coach Izzo, like, you know, I, I felt like ever since my uncle, ever since my uncle was taken from me, that my entire life was just spiraling out of control and I just didn't know what to do. And so uh, luckily, thankfully he saved my life in a lot of ways. Like he told me to, you know, find that motivation again, you know, go out and prove people wrong. Like I've always done because he, he knew everything about me, not only being on the autism spectrum, but he knew what every doctor and professional and doubter and hater in my life has said about me. And so from, for him to say, you know, you can do this, you will do this, but you got to do it. I can't do it for you. And so, but do I ever worry about emotional outbursts like that? Not as much um, because I know there's a time and place for all that. And what I mean by that is if I'm in a professional setting, like I can't have, you know, I got to try my absolute best not to have an outburst in a professional setting. But if I feel angry, if I feel upset, and I just need to just let out a yell, a, a loud yell or a loud scream. You know, I'll just go into my room or I'll go into my hotel room if I'm on the road, put my head in a pillow and just scream as loud as I can. <laughs> like just whatever, just just whatever I can do to like relief, like my anxiety, my anger, my stress. But I've also come up with different coping mechanisms too. And you know, when I was in high school, and this is where basketball came into play for me. Like I would, um, if I was about to have an anger or an outburst moment if I was stressed or if I had a lot of anxiety I would just tell my mom I'm taking the car keys I'm taking the car to the high school and I'm going to go to the gym and shoot for two hours and so and that's all I did I would just shoot free throws or jump shots or work on my dribbling and post moves for two hours and you know that was my happy place if you will that was my place of getting away from the world and not worrying about what was going on in my life and even though I don't have basketball anymore today, you know, I still have different ways I can have coping mechanisms, whether it's going for a four mile walk in my neighborhood I live in, or, you know, maybe it's listening to music to help calm me down, or maybe I need to go upstairs in my room for, you know, 10, 15 minutes just to relax by myself and just um, kind of get away from certain situations for a minute. So I've developed different ways to help calm me down. But are there still times that I feel like I need to just let out a giant scream? Oh yeah, there are. But I'm, <laughs> I'm able to find ways to, you know, hold those hold those yelling and screaming parts in. You know, it doesn't seem like like your autism is holding you back in any way. No, and and that's because like, and this is a credit. This is a big testament to my parents um, because my parents. Even my some of my teachers as well, they've always taught me to never use autism as a crutch in my life and to not let autism define you because autism does not define you like you define who you are. And autism is has always been a part of my life and it always will be. But it doesn't define what I'm going to do tomorrow. It doesn't define where I'm going to go tomorrow, what I'm going to do, who I'm going to talk to. Like, you know, it's just part of my story. Um, but at the same time, I'm also proud to be on the spectrum. I'm proud to have autism. And some folks listening to this may go, you know, why would you be proud of something that some people think is a curse? And meanwhile, I'm proud to have autism because number one, it, it made me into the person I am today. Number two, it helped me, you know, make history in a lot of different ways, not just in my life, but in Michigan State. But three, it's I'm also proud of it because I want to show others that, you know what, I may have autism. But at the same time, like autism doesn't define who I am. Like I get to define that. Hmm. That's great. Really now, Mom, I know you had some more questions for Anthony. Well, I can't. How in the world do you remember all the details of all the games and what happened? You know, for this show and that. I I couldn't. I was just blown away by the by the details in this book. That was really interesting. How did you do that? So, so for me, so this is kind of the blessing I have of having an autistic brain is like, I remember the littlest things in life. I really do. And, um, so for a couple of good examples, so, you know, if my wife needs to know what channel is Fox sports Detroit or what channel are the Detroit Tigers playing on, I'll tell her, Oh, they're on channel 232. (laughs) And she'll just look at me and go, well, what? what channel is Disney junior? And I'll be like, Oh, it's channel 354. And like, she'll look at me and go, well, how do you remember that? I'm like, Oh, I just do. And so, but 
the first time I ever did this with somebody, it was my, it was my roommate at Grand Valley state, Mike Prisdale. And we were just, um, we were in our apartment our sophomore year. And Mike says to me, Hey, what's the most random thing you can ever remember in your life? I said, I said, you really want to go this route? He said, yeah, absolutely. I'm like, okay, well, I remember, I remember all my scoring stats from sixth grade basketball. He goes, well, how many games did you play in? I said, it was six games. He said, okay, what were the points you scored? I'm like, okay, I scored, I scored 14, 12, 20, 30, uh, 33, 24, and 12. And he just looked at me with a blank stare in his face like, he, he was horrified. <laughs> I remember that. And he goes, how in the world did you remember that? I said, dude, that I, that's the blessing of having an autistic brain. You just remember the littlest things in life. And so, but even like the details of like, you know, my high school basketball games and some of my AAU games, like, you know, a lot of those games were some of my favorite games that I either that, that I was a part of or that I played in. And so, like whenever you go through life and you have events that, you know, great events that you're a part of or that you've been to in life or just like um, trips that you like you remember, like you're always going to remember those trips for the rest of your life. And for me, you know, it was always a blessing that I got to be a part of so many great games and be a part of a great bas- basketball teams and programs in my life that, you know, I'm always going to remember those stories and tell them for the rest of my life. But you know, just remembering the littlest details about certain games, like I guess is one of the biggest blessings of having an autistic brain, like you remember <laughs> the littlest things. Well, Anthony, it's been such a pleasure talking to you today, but we are running out of time. And we didn't even get to talk about your podcast because you have a the Centered Podcast that uh, people can check out on YouTube. And what do you talk about on there? So on the Center Podcast, uh, my guests and I, we talk about sports and life and, you know, you know my, my, get my guests' uh, journey through life and basically just what my guests have in life as far as, like, what they, you know, as far as, like, a positive energy, like, what makes them have a positive energy in life. Mm. Well, I'm going to have to check that out. And, Mom, do you have uh, some closing words for us today? Well, actually, they're, they're Anthony's words. Uh, I took from his book, um, page 88. He said, I say the world would be a boring place if we all had the same abilities. Mm. Is that your motto, Anthony? <laughs> so that and um, my my father's motto that he passed down to me, which is the harder you work, the more you learn. So those are definitely uh, two, uh, two of my favorite mottos I have in my life. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being with us. No, thank you guys for having me. It's been a blast. I appreciate it. And see you all next week on Writer's Voices.